Hello, and welcome to Queer as Folktales by Stories of Scotland. This mini-series is funded by the Edwin Morgan Trust Second Life Award. If you're a regular listener to this podcast, then this is something a little different, very magical, and wonderfully thrilling. I'm Jenny. And I'm Annie. And last week for LGBT History Month, we began to retell some of our favourite Scottish folklore with a rainbow twist. Now this episode is the second of three, so if you haven't listened to the first one, you need to go back in time and listen now to the Such or the Sea. Otherwise, this one will make very little sense to you. But if you've already been through the Such or the Sea, then let's jump back to the Pentland Firth, where our young hero, Mary, is crossing the sea to hunt for the stolen supernatural seal skin of her selkie love. Try saying that after we dram, eh? We join our fisher, Mary, on the deck of the old, reliable ferry to Caithness. The lower decks are an odd yet predictable mix of fresh workmen itching to get to the mainland and tired yet contented families of tourists looking back at Orkney with wistful eyes. As soon as the cafe opened, Mary left her seat and headed up to the deck. The sound of trays laden with chips sliding back and forth on the tables made her restless. As she ate her chips, she didn't look back to Orkney or forward to the mainland. Instead, she looked out to the sea. She let herself get lost in the deep, swirling pools of dark water, imagining each one circled a secret she didn't know. As she watched the water pass, she noticed that there were large patches where the swirls and waves seemed to stop. They lost all their energy, and an eerie calm settled on the water. She knew these patches well, They are the result of two oceans colliding, the warm Atlantic Ocean from the west and the cold North Sea from the east. Two completely different worlds colliding. And the result? Blissful calm. That is for now, of course. The power of these tides is unrivaled anywhere in the world, and every few years a ship gets it wrong and is swallowed by the sea. It's such a dangerous sea, that the north coast of Caithness used to be known as the Coast of Widows. Nowadays, however, the Pentland Firth is known for innovation in tidal energy. Mary used to think that she knew the sea well, not as well as her dad or old Billy the Fisher, but she always felt more at home on the water than she did on the land. But as she looked out at the currents colliding, she realised she didn't know the sea at all, not the real sea, not the Selkie Sea. All she will ever know of her Selkie's world is the surface. She has let the Selkie into her world completely and utterly, has exposed her to everything and the soul of her island. But what does she know of the Selkie's world, the Selkie's being? What is it like below the patches of calm where the currents really meet and mix? Mary looked away from the water As a seasick tourist had joined her up on the deck, she gave him a smile. It'll pass, she said. Do you think we'll see any whales? He asked. It's not the whales you want to be looking out for. It's the mermaids, Mary replied. Below deck, the wee terrier Alan waits patiently in the belly of the boat while his best friend muses over the journey. The landscape of Caithness is rich with the jagged archaeology left by its ancient inhabitants. There's no doubt that this land has been lived on for millennia. Hard rock structures break through the earth-like bones, piercing through, reminding us that our landscape embodies our heritage. Mary drove down the A9, a familiar road that she'd always liked to drive. As she headed south, her spirits began to lighten. The road was slow with the tourism traffic, but she didn't mind. This slower pace meant that she could appreciate the coast. 
She sang along to her dad's old run rig CD, and in her back seat, Al and the dog felt victim to her singing. The local lore tells us that Caithness has so many Iron Age remnants because the farmers wouldn't touch the archaeology for fear of upsetting supernatural beings. They didn't want to disturb the fairies who lived in the dark shadows of the cairns, or the spirits of the folks who had built them with such skill. Mary parked beside a crumbling and long abandoned church and hopped out her car with Alan and put him on his lead. They walked down the side of the road towards the broch. An uneasiness settled into the pit of her stomach. For as she approached the broch, a wave of disappointment washed over her. Bruin broch wasn't what she was expecting at all. A broch is an Iron Age dry stone tower. It's a building unique to the far north, west coast and Isles of Scotland. Brochs are dry stone, which means that for the whole building, there's absolutely no mortar holding it together. Now this sounds like something quite small, but it's absolutely spectacular and requires a unique kind of craft that relies on incredible expertise. The stones are set together and interlocked in a really carefully planned and engineered manner. Brochs were built to be high, round structures, and in the well-preserved brochs, we can see that they had multiple floors. They were an absolute feat of Iron Age engineering and ingenuity, and it's very hard to stand in or around a broch and not feel an amazing connection to Scotland's ancient people. They are buildings that leave you speechless and in absolute awe of what an ancient society could build. I grew up playing in rocks and they never ceased to fascinate me. Ah, but you see, Bruin isn't so well preserved. It looks more like a grassy pile of stones than it does a building. So as Mary approached Bruin, she was slightly underwhelmed. She couldn't see any signs of magic. Not one, not even a toadstool or a rabbit with an interesting story to tell. There was nothing haunting, nothing mystical, nothing out of the ordinary. Bruin was a ruin. It looked as though the dry stone had collapsed in on itself centuries ago. Ruins are a familiar feature of the north of Scotland. The empty monuments of the dead sometimes outnumbering the homes of the living. But Bruin Broch wasn't supposed to be empty. It was supposed to be full of the fey folk. Mary paced around the broch. She was looking for a place of entry, something that looked like a door into the world of fairies. But instead of some kind of magical doorway, she found herself examining ancient rocks and intricate lichen. A few ragged primroses were blooming for the end of April. It took a while, but eventually Mary got bored. Alan was frustrated at being kept in his lead, clearly eager to be free to undertake his own canine archaeology. And so Mary sat by the broch and waited for something to happen, a small concern ebbing at her mind that perhaps Billy the Fisher had sent her to the wrong ruin. Mary wasn't sure whether the number of ruins in the Highlands made it easier or harder to believe in supernatural beings, and she found herself wondering how much she believed in Selkie Sinead, washing up in the beach one day, so mystical and powerful in some ways, and yet so helpless without her skin, like a crab without its claws. Sighing, she plugged in her headphones and waited. She felt more doubt building in her mind. She couldn't bear the thought of going home empty-handed, but it was beginning to get dark, the final light of the gloaming fading. Now listeners, this might sound a little bit strange, but don't be afraid for our Mary. Anyone who grows up in the Highlands knows that young folks become quickly accustomed to spending random nights in dark fields. It's something that is just part of growing up here, a rite of passage. 
though usually you have at least one friend and maybe a bottle of cider or something stronger if you can. Ah, but Mary did have something stronger. She remembered Billy the Fisher's home-brewed turnip wine and decided that if she was going to spend all night in a field waiting for fairies, she might as well be jolly. She opened the bottle and immediately regretted it. The smell was almost abrasive, more akin to strong cleaning potions. It was the kind of odour that screamed at every piece of common sense in your body that it's an unsafe substance. There is a reason that turnip wine is not enjoyed by the mainstream, or even on the fringe of craft wine connoisseurs. Nevertheless, Mary was feeling brave, and so she took a sip. The turnip wine seared her mouth. It had managed to capture the most unpleasant aspects of both sweet and sour. It was sickening, overpowering acid with just a hint of rotten root vegetables. Instinctively, she spat it out in disgust, spraying the broch with a fine mist of turnip wine. Mary firmly screwed the top back on and cursed the bottle. But then, as though a faraway echo, she heard a few playful notes of the fiddle. Alan's ears pricked up too, and his head darted around, trying to locate the source of this fiddling. In a beat, it became an immersive sound, all around them, coming out of the darkness from every side. It was like listening to the sound of waves underwater. The whole sound was wrapped around them. And it became louder and faster and more powerful, and then it stopped. And out of the moonlight and through a turnip wine mist stepped a mysterious figure. And what are you doing with turnip wine out by a brook so late? You want to be careful. This can be a dangerous place to be wasting good brew. The strange man approached her. Alan let out his trademark cowardly yelp at the stranger and hid behind Mary's legs. A brave guardian, Alan was not. I'm looking for answers, Mary said nervously. I- I'm looking for answers from fairies. <laughs> you must be young if you still believe in answers. The stranger's features came into focus as he approached Mary. His face was both chiselled and etched. He had high cheekbones and a distinctive brow. Though he had no wrinkles, he still seemed to have deeper shadows in the lines of his face than the moonlight should have allowed. Bulky oilskins were firmly tied round him. Yet he had an odd light-footed way of walking, a strange rocking motion. Mary felt a bit seasick by the time he was in front of her. If you aren't going to drink that, I'll tuck it off your hands. The man extended a long arm for the wine. Mary reached out to hand him the bottle, then hesitated. You can have this, but only if you show me the way into the broch, to the fairies. Even admitting that she was looking for fairies made Mary feel a bit silly, but the tall man wasn't laughing. And so she tried to sound firm and sure by adding, I might not get my answers, but I need to try. The tall man gave a smooth, bobbing nod, and so she handed him the offensive turnip wine, but warned as she did, Be careful, that stuff is poison. The mysterious stranger smirked at her as he inhaled the pungent vapours. That's a vintage, my dear, and the way in is right there, behind you. You were almost right with your thinking that the world of the Fae is inside the broch. But you see, it's no inside that we're going. Ony fool can see the broch has well and truly collapsed under the weight of centuries. No, we are going below the broch, into the earth. This broch is simply a waymark for the liminal space between the living and the deed, the past and the future, the human, and the myth. Oh, that is some good turned up wine. It's been a fair while since I tasted anything like this. Inside the earth? Is there a trapdoor? 
or a slide? Mary asked, hoping that whatever the way was, it didn't involve any digging, no matter how talented Alan was at making holes. The gently swaying figure responded, Ugh, doesn't the moonlight cast such lovely shadows upon this ancient ruin? He made his way towards the broch. Now, just which shadow is the longest, do you think? Is it here, or is it there, maybe? He moved between the shadows as if he were one. Ah, this is the winner, right in front of me. Mary waited for him to step out of the shadow and continue his journey around the broch, but he did not return from the darkness. He had vanished. Alan barked in confusion and Mary patted his head, more for her comfort than his. Aware that this might be her only chance, she followed the friendly, unusual and now slightly tipsy man into the longest shadow cast by the moonlight and the ruins of Bruin Broch. The light shifted, the ground swayed, and Mary and Alan entered the land, or the underland, of the fairies. In this realm, the moon was just as bright, but it shone from behind them, illuminating the opening of the tunnel that they now stood inside. This tunnel did not need the moon's light, however, as it was, in fact, already very well lit. Lined along each wall stood dozens of children holding flaming torches, playing amongst themselves. Each wore old-fashioned clothes, handmade and patched, and only a few of them had shoes. But nevertheless, they looked very happy, very mischievous. The children seemed delighted with their new guests, lifting their torches and ushering them forwards. The swaying stranger was a few paces ahead, he raised the bottle of turnip wine and had a drink to their bravery. The fairy hall is not too far, but keep close to me. These bairns are always keen to help folks and fae get lost. As Mary began to follow, the children giggled at them with their wide, toothy <laughs> smiles. Some gave shy waves, and one young lad bowed so deeply his nose brushed the earth. Mary couldn't orientate herself in the land of the fairies, and stepping under the earth, she felt as though she were stepping onto a boat for the first time, the land suddenly making her uneasy in her own foundations. It was very cluttered under the earth. All along the tunnel, Mary saw piles of old <laughs> junk, centuries of rubbish piled up. Only, as she looked closer between a fly-tipped washing machine and an inconsiderately stacked pile of mindfully balanced rocks, there was the glistenings of armour and jewels, and even bones. <gasps> there are bodies down here! She gasped at the sight of a corpse so shriveled that the skeleton shone through. There are bodies up there too, one of the children whispered back in response. Yes, but the bodies in my world are alive, Mary whispered back to the torch-wielding infant. She lifted a board of soggy plywood that was covering the remainder of the human remains and saw that they lay peacefully to the side of the tunnel. Ceremonial items surrounded the corpse, a sword, a comb, a bowl of grain, albeit very, very, very mouldy grain. The hair was braided in a delicate, intricate pattern, maybe by someone who had loved this warrior in life or maybe by one of the increasingly creepy fire-wielding children. Either way, it all looked ancient, perhaps a thousand years. Ah, I see you've found our viking. Personally, I've always preferred the Pictish Queen. She's just over there. The words of her fey friend broke the spell of her dwam. I'm sorry, I got caught here. I've never seen a dead body before. As Mary stood up, she realised that the whole tunnel wasn't just filled with junk. Behind the children lay skeletons, corpses and traces of rituals scorched on the earth. You should ask him to dance at the ball. Oh, hopscotch, one of the children suggested. I think his dancing days are long past, 
Mary retorted. The dust had settled on his body long ago. Also, the plywood. This isn't what Mary had imagined the realm of the Fae would be like. She wished that old Billy had warned her of how the passage into the world of the fairies was a catacomb. The deeper she passed into the subterranean realm, the deeper the sense of unease in her stomach became. It was as though the audience of mischievous children watching her were joined by the dead. As she followed the fairy further down the passage, Mary became conscious of the weight of the jewellery hanging around her neck, a gift from her almost beloved. So many of the bodies were buried with talisman and symbols surrounding them, beads and brooches, jewels and shells. After what felt like a lifetime, the passage of graves came to an end. Mary leaned against the wall, cautious not to disturb any of the dead. The small glowing torches clutched by the children who had followed gave a haunting, dancing light. The children played with ease, not paying any mind to the bones and bodies that littered their playground. They stood in front of a heavy door of dark wood. Carved into this wood were interlaced Celtic symbols weaving through each other as organically as a plant growing or a stream meandering. Mary's new friend turned to her and said, That's a fairy ballroom beyond this. Lass, I've taken a shine to you, so I'll, uh, I'll give you some advice. Leave the wee dog with me. Go into the hall yourself. You don't want to be taking him in there with you. Dog years and human years already differ enough. Alan doesn't do well without me, Mary responded, keen to keep her canine companion by her side. You'll do better here, believe me. The man tried to reassure her. Plus, if things take a little longer than expected, well, I'll make sure the wee dog stays up in the land of the living. Reluctantly, Mary handed over the lead to her guide and bent down to pat Alan's ears. You'll be okay, Alan. I won't be gone long. She looked up at the fairy man who had brought her here and finally asked, You're Douglas of Longlegs, aren't you? The one and only... Like I said, this isn't my first taste of turnip wine. This calmed Mary, knowing that whatever happened, Alan was in the hands of someone with Billy the Fisher's trust. Douglas of Longlegs took a swig of turnip wine and said, Be warned, lass, if you want your answers, be prepared to dance. With this, Douglas of Longlegs took a swig of turnip wine. Mary braced herself for the Cayley and opened the door to enter the fairy hall all alone. The fairy ballroom was grand in an ancient way. It was lit by at least a thousand candles, maybe even like 1,200 candles. Honestly, Mary was just relieved that it wasn't lit by spooky little bairns. For as many candles as there were, most of the light they gave out was absorbed by the old stone walls. In front of Mary, countless fairies were Cayley dancing. They danced like whirlpools or storms, ferociously fast and in wild synchronisation. Immediately, a stocky fairy woman grabbed Mary by the hands and flung her into the heat of the dance. Mary's companion took the lead straight away. Her assertive dance style matched the unusual inky blue tattoos, or perhaps paintings, across her body. Just in time, eh? The painted fairy lady roared over the reel of the furiously fiddling fiddlers. The Kayleigh's just getting started, eh? And we had an odd number of folks to dance. Mary didn't know the dance she was being led on, but kept pace with the fairy that had snatched her up. It was a dizzying march, and the nerves in her stomach sloshed around with every spin. She daren't speak for fear she might bite her own tongue. Before she knew it, the painted fairy had spun her into the arms of a different fae, this time a slender man. As Mary slipped out of his hands to jump back and clap, she got a good look at the dancers around her. There was no rhyme or reason to who was dancing with who, or who was leading and who was following. The fae folk were euphoric in their dance. Her partner wished her well and half spun, half flung her onto the next, a man wearing thick furs and rags. He continued the reel with her, and Mary realised that as she spun quicker, the last remaining caution spun right out of her. She danced with her new partner, 
as though they had been dancing together all their lives. His braided hair flew wildly around him. As she watched it, Mary thought that she recognised the braid, that she had seen a similar one not long ago, or long ago. She couldn't quite place when. Suddenly, fear grabbed her by the throat and spoke her words for her. <gasps> I've seen you before. I crouched by your corpse and, and cleared your resting place. Are you a fairy or, or are you the dead? Mary asked him as she danced along through no choice of her own. We're all in between in the underland, the Viking explained without missing a beat. We're all people of earth and sea. But I saw your very dead body outside, Mary told him, gasping for breath. Fairy folk and human folk are equal in flesh, but fairy time and human time, well, they are very different things. While yours is linear, ours, oh, it dances. With this, the Viking winked and spun her around into the arms of a different partner. And so the Cayley went. Mary danced round the hall in a state of dizzying bafflement. Occasionally, on her partner's, she recognised a brooch or a hairpin that she had seen on one of the bodies that littered the tunnel into the fairy underland. She wondered if they recognised her shell necklace from when she passed by their graves. The fairies were beautiful in the candlelight, the exact opposite of their corpses in the tunnel. Their faces were so full of life and light, as though they knew all the secrets of joy and pleasure. And Mary couldn't help it. She let herself get carried along in the delight of the fairies. She picked up the steps quickly. Years of social dancing had done her well, and she became lighter on her feet, moving to the rhythms of the fairy fiddlers. Her ears were enchanted with their sweet notes. But there was something offbeat. Close to her being, she heard a different rhythm. It was an untamed clitter-clattering sound, throwing her off the pulse of the dance. It was all around her. It was on her. Such an unsophisticated noise ruining the joy of the music. No melody to it at all. No beauty. Looking down, she found its source. It was the clashing of the shells around her neck. Oh, how ghastly. Her hand grasped at the necklace to rip it off and stamp out its ugly sound. But as she held the shells in her hand, their meaning shot through her. This necklace was a gift from her Selkie. Not only was it too hideous to sell on Etsy, it was too hideous to Kaylee. Putting the clacking shells back on, Mary dredged up her reason for being here. She loved Selkie Sinead, and she was here for answers. She stopped listening to the fiddling and instead listened to the necklace and danced to its syncopated beat. Her fairy partner grew annoyed with her erratic excuse for a reel and stopped dancing too. Just what are you doing? They exclaimed. I have questions, she said to the fairy, who was desperately trying to get her to rejoin the enchanted dance. Do you know who took my selkie's skin? We've all got questions, the fairy whispered back at her. But do you believe in answers? The music got louder, and the fairy whisked Mary back up into the dance once more. Just as she was losing herself in the swirls, again the shells clacked the reminder all around her. But still, she was passed on to her next partner, and again and again. She begged all those who danced with her to answer, who had stolen her selkie Sinead sealskin. Each dancer would whisper an obscure fairy answer back at her, never for the question she asked. And so the Kaylee went on, with the force of all the fairy spirits, of all their centuries and millennia under the earth. Nevertheless, they kept the Kaylee moving onwards. The earth is my fortress. I can catch thunderbolts. And pull you down. I have done it before. The earth the is, earth my, is fortress. my fortress. I can catch, I thunderbolts, can catch thunderbolts and pull you and down. Pull you down. I have the done it before. is my fortress. The dead will die. The, the dead, dead will die. die. If the living are asleep. If the, the living are asleep, waken them. The ruins speak. The ruins and speak. And pull you down. The ruins and pull you down. 
awaken them. The ruin, yeah, this is my fortress. The ruins, the ruins speak. speak. The ruins speak. I have done it before. The, the living are fortress. asleep, waking them. The, the ruins the speak, fortress. waking them. And pull you down. Mary was completely out of control in her own body until, with an abrupt shock, the music stopped. The final fairy she had danced with bowed deeply to her and plucked two goblets from a passing tree. He was a short fairy, dressed in an old style of plaid draped over his muscled shoulders. It wasn't a bright tartan, but one of muddy greens. Mary had never seen a plaid like it before and couldn't place it in this century. The fairy stood with a stocky pride. Perhaps he had been a hunter or a warrior, or maybe he worked the land. But when? Fifty years ago? Five hundred? Disjointed by his agelessness, Mary looked around for something to ground her in a time that she was sure of. Everything and everyone was timeless. The stocky fairy handed Mary a goblet and drank deeply from his own. Fragrances of floral honeysuckle and summertime soothed her jumbled mind. She became conscious of how tired all her limbs were, as if she hadn't rested in weeks. I just need to know, please. It's a friend of mine. A selkie washed up on Scapa Beach in a storm at the spring tide. Someone stole her sealskin, and I've been told that the fairies would know. That you will know. Please. The fairy shrugged. Well, we fairies hold many secrets of the world above, but save yourself the burdens that come with the answers. Take a drink of your heather ale. It'll provide you all the answers you need. Drink, my dear, and stay down here. Oh, the kale is just getting started. Oh, please won't you help me? I can't stay here. My selkie needs me, Mary pleaded, handing the undrunk ale back to the fairy. He surveyed her first with disappointment on his grooved face, and then with something that looked like respect. Either way, he clearly enjoyed watching her squirm. Well, we could do this the old-fashioned way if you desire, alas. A glint of excitement flashed across the plated fairy's eyes as he sipped his ale. It depends what the old ways are. How old is old? Mary asked. Why, with a riddle, of course replied the fairy in a heartbeat. If you answer correctly, I'll tell you what I know of this stolen selkie skin you ask of. If you get it wrong, well, then you'll drink your ale and you'll dance, now and after and forever. Mary simultaneously felt relieved that there was a way out and horribly trapped. Uh, well, it sounds as though a riddle is my only choice. At this point, a circle of fairies started to gather around them, intrigued by the game. They whispered amongst themselves, some in languages that Mary couldn't understand. Aha! Well then, we play by the everlasting rules. I provide you a riddle and three guesses. If the answer evades you thrice, then you kelly with us forever, the fairy explained. Mary agreed to the terms and a hush fell over the fairies that surrounded them, as though they had been waiting for this moment for a very long time. Perhaps the dance itself had been a riddle, but now it was clearly Mary who was the entertainment. The plated fairy stepped back, took a deep breath, and recited his riddle. In my first life, I served the living. In my next life, I served the deed. Then I come back for the living, Lay doon wi a hole in my heed. I'm popular in my depopulation. I'll sell to outlanders my sorrow song. I keep the land chained in ghosts as I feign isolation. And you'll tack a picture and then you'll be gone. What am I? Mary stood in confusion, her brain frantically piecing together the words to make sense of them. As she repeated them out aloud, the answer bubbled up from below. Your first life is for the living. Your next life is for the deed. You're a graveyard, she exclaimed in hope and relief. Wrong, that's your first to guess up. 
the plated fairy again wore two expressions, one of glee and one of sympathy. It wasn't the answer that had risen in her, but panic. Mary felt her heart pounding in her chest, realising how foolish she was to agree to this game. She could barely complete a crossword without the help of her whole family and a few of the neighbours. You're popular in your depopulation. You're selling to outlanders your sorrow song. In the silence that now shrouded the circle of fairies, another answer revealed itself. Sure of herself this time, Mary exclaimed, You're the landscape. With visions of heather-clad mountains in her mind, Mary was confident that this one was the solution. A gasp came from around the fairy court. <gasps> A deep inhalation as the ballroom stood in wait. Unfortunately, young human, that is again incorrect. That's you on your last guess now, but I'm sure you already knew that. The plated fairy smiled slightly hungrily this time. Mary felt the eyes of hundreds of fairies upon her. A wave of loneliness crashed over her, but she reached to the ugly shell necklace around her neck and remembered why she was here. I keep the land chained in ghosts as I feign isolation, and you'll tack a picture, and then you'll be gone, she whispered both to herself and the hundreds of fairies watching. Oh, she thought to herself, if I get this one wrong, then that's it. I've ruined it. I've ruined everything. Wait. Wait, that's it? That's the answer. What are you? She shouted. You're a ruin. You're a ruin. The silence of the fairy ballroom was palpable, overwhelming. The moment drew out for a lifetime. You are correct, young human. I am a ruin. I'll give you your answer. You've earned it in time. I have heard it whispered through these halls that on the night of the spring tide, the Loch Laird stole a Selkie's skin. It was taken by the hooves of a Kelpie, one that dwells in the River Ness. You'll find them flowing between the islands under the shadow of Tomnahurich. The plaided fairy held out his hand to Mary. As she took his hand, he slipped something small into it. It was cold and strangely shaped and Mary squeezed it tightly in her own hand and slid it into her back pocket. Thank you, she whispered, her throat feeling very dry all of a sudden. If I were you, I would leave quickly, before the next dance starts. And good luck down there. The Loch Laird is not as kind as us, the plated fairy uttered under his breath. Without needing told twice, Mary turned on her heel and headed towards the door she had arrived through. The fiddlers were already playing long notes, warming up their instruments. Soon, the Kaylee would start again. The fairies around her were pairing up, crowding round her, getting in her way, trying to entice her to stay and dance more. As she left, the door felt different as she opened it, the handle with more weight. Just as the music started, Mary rushed through the door and back into the catacomb. The cold quiet of the earth felt calming, peaceful, she immediately felt safer in the sleepy subterranean tunnels with the bodies of the dead than she had in the Hall of the Fairies. But as Mary closed the door firmly behind her, she was roughly attacked by the joyful licking tongue of Alan! Yes! Alan's okay! <laughs> On his hind legs, he was just about able to reach her hand. Douglas of long legs was waiting for her and gave her a tight hug. Alan missed you, although you weren't in there for as long as I expected, Douglas explained. Still, he had better be moving quickly. The summer is almost over. Mary took Alan's lead back from Douglas. Oh, thank you so much for looking after him, she said with genuine gratitude. I'm late for the Cayley, Douglas replied, with a shadow over his face. The dancing has already begun, but if you would, give this to young Billy the Fisher for me. Douglas of Longlegs handed Mary a package. It was neatly addressed to Billy in the land of the humans. He's all Billy now, Mary told Douglas, 
as she thought he should know. Not to me, he isn't. Douglas gave a final warm smile, and with that, Mary and the fairy went on their separate ways, one to the land of the living, and the other to the land of the living spirits. The torch-bearing children led Mary and Alan back to the realm of the humans, but as she turned to thank them, all she saw in front of her was the ruin of Bruin Broch. The night was warm around her, still quite light, though the moon was high. Embarrassingly, Alan was chewing on a souvenir bone he had removed from the land of the fairies. Mary found her car, still parked by the old kirk, and after a few tries it started. She turned on her phone and was greeted by a few voicemails from Selkie Sinead. My dearest Mary, so you've been gone longer than expected. I've really missed you. Everyone is doing well. Billy the Fisher has been telling everyone that your journey is kind of a technology-free, intensive Kaylee dancing course with fairies. Hurry home. It's been too long. I hope you're safe. Mari, I... I really miss you. Arf! Mari made a few apologetic phone calls and then she was off heading south to the River Ness, one step closer to finding her love's skin. Thank you all so much for joining us in the Fairy Broch. It has been such an amazing party. Next week... We will be completing this trilogy, Queer as Folk Tales, with a episode close to our home, set on the banks of the River Ness in Inverness. We're going to meet the Kelpies who play in the water, and hopefully we'll find out whether this story ends in love or in tragedy. So join us next week. And until then, Slanjiba, stay safe and don't drink anything that the fairies offer you unless you want to wake up a hundred years later. <laughs>